next up, and for her first time on stage with Odd Salon, please welcome Megan Dahl speaking on the life and trials of Oscar Wilde. I am of the shortness, I apologize. <sighs> Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, no, maybe? All right, wonderful. So, Oscar Wilde, where do I start? So there he was. He was in prison. He was so overclenched at the time, just lamenting and writing love letters and just pissing and moaning. But it was all because of this letter that you see right above me, proclaiming him as a psalmodite. <laughs> so for those who don't know what that word means, it means sodomite. Uh, but it, let's gloss over this gr very gross misspelling and kind of focus on Oscar Wilde or Oscar Fingal O'Flaherty Wills Wild if you're nasty. <laughs> so where do we begin? We could begin at his time of, in Oxford when he decided to dabble in some social activism or that other time, you know, when he sailed to America for aestheticism to lecture us. Or that other time where he supposedly had sex with Walt Whitman. <laughs> <laughs> But we could also talk about his bizarre love triangle with Francesca and her husband, Bram Stoker. But that's not really where we start. So, Oscar Wilde. <laughs> Born October 16th, 1854, to a William Robert Wills Wilde, isn't he so handsome? And his lovely wife, uh, Jane Francesca Angus Wilde, in Westerland Row, Dublin. Now, the reason he was in a dress, his mother would often want a girl and would dress him as one. So he had a very eccentric upbringing, to say the least. Uh, so from there, we kind of focus on why Wilde was in prison because of this guy. Uh, so, no, he's not quite the villain you would expect. Um, I like to dub him a manic pixie dream fuckboy. So, <laughs> his name is Lord Alfred Bosey Douglas. So, people called him Bosey for reasons that his mother just decided for whatever. But he was an arrogant, narcissistic party animal. <laughs> And Wilde was in love. He was so in fascinated by Bosey and his golden hair and charm. So you would think, and this, this reference I loved, by the way, uh, you would think that his 16 Candles experience, this is Robbie. This is, <laughs> this is Wilde's best friend and ex-lover and confidant. So, Bosey, being the new guy in town, is not the ducky in this situation. Robbie is in love with Wilde. Uh, not trying to break them up per se, but Wilde would often write letters about their tumultuous relationship, whether it be love, hate, their breakups, whatever. I'm sure we've all been there. But Wilde, he is, to Robbie, would write this letter about Bosey, he is quite the narcissist. So white and gold, Bosey is so tired, he lies there like a hyacinth on the sofa, and I worship him. So to give you an idea, he was smitten. Just to give you an idea, because Wilde often felt like the father figure that Bosey could never had, and, and then some. So Bosey's dad would often threaten Bosey. Uh, so his dad, John Queensberry, uh, or the Magistry Queensberry, or he would often threaten Bosey to break it up. You know, they should no longer see each other. I will stop paying you money. You have to stop this right away. But Wilde, in his ways, would often still proclaim his love to the end of his breaths, no less. 
until this guy, he just had a vendetta. This is uh, the father. This is the Marquise of Queensbury, Wilde's nemesis. Boo, hiss. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. It would have more song and dance. But so he was obsessed with ruining their relationship. And it may have been because his firstborn son allegedly committed suicide for also having a gay relationship, but we're not going to go there. So in this, thank you, uh, the Mar Marquise, he would hire boxers to try to fight wild. He would go and try to throw rotten vegetables. He would go up and down to restaurants and hotels being like, if I ever see my son in that wild man, I'm going to start beating people up. And then this note happens. So one day, the Marquise decides to write this note after a lot of ongoing back and forth with his son. And he writes this note saying, for Oscar Wilde posing Somadite, threatening his manhood and possible flamboyantness, Oscar sees this note. And he's a little like outraged. But Bozy puts this little bug in his ear saying, you know what? We should totally sue my dad for libel. So they thought it was a good idea, even though Robbie, his ducky, and a lot of other good friends and his supposed attorney were like, hey, this is a really bad idea. But he was blinded by love. And we get to the trial. So Oscar brings Bozy's father to court. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Look hard enough, you'll see him. <laughs> so they're in court. Oscar is looking dressed to the nine, impressing everybody with his verses, talking about his eccentric love letters and how amazing they are, not really pointing out the, the glaring homosexual overtones. Uh, you know, they would often bring witnesses of these call boys and the gifts that he would get or that he would give to them in regards to all the nights that Oscar would spend spending money on Bozy's lovers and call boys, etc. So it got a little crazy, maybe even wild. So, I don't know. But they never really came to a verdict. They dropped the charges, or at least Wilde dropped the case after much convincing. But all behind the scenes, the Mag Magris, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but he has been investigating and getting more evidence to prove that the libel case is true. And back then in 1895, uh, if you could prove that the case you're being, I don't know, prosecuted for is actually true, you might get a little locked up in jail. So the second trial happens. And in the second trial, they mostly repeat the first trial, which is bringing all the boys to the yard, all pointing shame at Oscar Wilde for being a potential hom homosexual, um, to which he gets locked up, which is where we get the profundus, which is one of the many writings in the two years that Oscar is in jail that he writes to Bozy. And it is, I highly recommend you listen to it or read it because it is the most brutal love-hate letter. And it's about, if you see it on YouTube, it's about six hours. It's crazy. He is very wordy. So, <laughs> so in this, he is so heartbroken that in the two years, that he is stuck in prison. Bozy never calls or writes or anything. So when he gets released, Robbie, shining in on a steed, comes to his rescue, gets him out on bail. And then they go off to Flor uh, Florida, no, France, I mean. <laughs> they run off to France. <laughs> and they eventually, Bozy comes back and Wilde forgives him. And he never actually got the Profundus letter. So the Profundus letter, what happened was, Wilde gave it to Robbie. 
and he told Robbie to give it to Bozy. And what happened was, Wilde changed his mind, and Bozy never saw the letter until after Wilde's death. So when, the death, when his death happened, or when they actually remet, pardon my French, when they remet, they never knew, he never knew how much pain Wilde was in. So they reconnected, they stayed together up until his death. And when he passed away, Robbie published the letters, <laughs> named it Defundus, and there was a big, big fight, blow up between Bozy and Robbie after that, if you can imagine, but to say the least, this is wild, and let's raise a glass for the love that dare not speak his name, the one and only Oscar Wilde, and his torrid love affair with this manic pixie fuckboy Bozy. Cheers. <laughs>